There's also growing evidence of an association between chronic rhinosinusitis and cardiovascular disease, with two large cohort studies finding an apparent increased risk of about 50%. And it's important because there's a synergy between bacteria and fungi. They're often found in close approximation to each other. For example, recent research reveals that the yeast Candida orbicans, also very commonly found in the mouth, can internalise the bacterium Helicobacter pylori, which is most famous for causing stomach ulcers. Basically, Candida can swallow Helicobacter pylori and protect it from the immune system and antibiotics. Accordingly, this makes Helicobacter pylori difficult to treat with antibiotic therapy alone. And while there's not been much in the way of testing prescription antifungal agents as adjuncts, there's been some high quality research on the addition of probiotics to the treatment for Helicobacter pylori. This meta-analysis, for example, found that the probiotic Saccharomyces boulardii increased the success rate of standard treatment of Helicobacter pylori by 11% which is quite significant, all the while reducing treatment side effects by half. Now, this is of more than just academic interest. This study, for example, found that more than a third of ischemic heart disease patients were infected with Helicobacter pylori, while this paper found Helicobacter pylori DNA in more than half of surgically removed atherosclerotic plaques. The point I'm making is that we should be mindful that it's very plausible that a combination of fungus and mixed bacteria may commonly contribute to atherosclerosis. So now the question is, exactly how can the infections be so damaging to our arteries? It's now widely understood and accepted that atherosclerosis begins with damage to the internal lining of the arteries, the layer called the endothelium which is for the most part made up of a single layer of cells. It is not, however, bare like you see in this picture. Rather, it has a fur-like coating, which we call the glycocalyx. You can see here in yellow the single layer of cells that makes up the endothelial layer. And on top, you can see this endothelial glycocalyx. Discovered in the 1960s through electron microscopy, the glycocalyx lines every single blood vessel in your body, and it's incredibly important to your vascular health. It also just so happens that infections can destroy it. The glycocalyx serves several essential roles in our blood vessels. It acts as a gatekeeper. It lets tiny essentials like water, electrolytes, and nutrients pass through, while at the same time blocking larger particles like microbes, and LDL. Those hairs also fend off clots by blocking platelets and inhibiting coagulation pathways in the blood. Those hairs are packed with antioxidants like superoxide dismutase, which can neutralize harmful free radicals like reactive oxygen species. It can also elegantly control blood pressure. Flowing blood bends the hairs much like seaweed sways in a current and stimulates the endothelial cells to release a compound called nitric oxide, which in addition is also potent at inhibiting blood clotting. It also relaxes the muscles within the artery locally to help regulate the blood pressure. In short, the glycocalyx is our artery's front line defense. And when you hear the term endothelial dysfunction, it almost certainly means that the glycocalyx has been damaged. And the problem is infections of all flavors, virus, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, are very effective at destroying the glycocalyx. Most infections through inflammation result in upregulation of proteases, which are enzymes that degrade proteins. And amongst their targets is the glycocalyx. We have proof of this in several human studies where levels of particular proteoglycans called syndican are measured in the blood. Normally, levels of free syndican should be very low, but if the glycocalyx is damaged, it gets released from the glycocalyx, sheds off the lining of our blood vessels, 
and enters the circulation. And several studies show very high levels of free syndican in the blood associated with infection. A normal level should be less than about 30 nanograms a mil, but in infection, it can exceed levels of 1,000 nanograms a mil. And damage to the glycocalyx can be, as well as being severe, it can be very rapid. This mouse study found that injected bacterial toxins called lipopolysaccharides were able to reduce the thickness of the glycocalyx by more than 98% in just 24 hours. This was a study in 13 human subjects who received low-dose intravenous bacterial endotoxin, again lipopolysaccharide, there was a 50% reduction of the height of the glycocalyx after just four hours, correlating with the presence of increased components circulating freely in their blood. And while the general inflammation upregulates these proteolytic enzymes, there are other specific contributors to glycocalyx damage that other infections can inflict. For example, influenza A and B infections secrete an enzyme called neuraminidase, which directly cleaves a core component of the glycocalyx. And this likely explains why the risk of a heart attack in the weeks after flu is increased by six times. <laughs>